This is Ozzy, and this is Ozzy's roadmap to success. Now, um, uh, let me see, where do we start off? Ozzy's uh, guardians had worked with a, a dog trainer a couple years ago, so we were able to skip over some of the stuff I normally come over fundamentals-wise, like uh, marker words. But I would like it, by the time you guys watch this, hopefully you guys have already done this. If not, walk around your house, yes, treat, yes, treat. Uh, I don't think you have to do a lot. He was pretty responsive to it, but especially if you're gonna use it for celebrating a lot of things we went over. It's just really important that yes has value. So every time I say yes, he gets a treat or you click and give him the treat. I like to, again, uh, when you're practicing or doing loading exercises or anything with dogs, the more variety you have, the better. Dogs don't generalize well, so you need a lot of variety in your practice for dogs to really uh, assimilate something properly. All right, so uh, uh, let me see. I'd also brush up on your hand targeting. Now, one thing I forgot to go over uh, with you guys, and I'm gonna go over this here so it's the beginning, is something called a positive interrupter. Um, so I heard uh, one of the guards making a kissing sound. So uh, right now, Ozzy is kind of eating some, something on the grass. So let's say it's something I don't want him to do. Touch. Ozzy. Yes. So the pause interrupter is a sound that you make that interrupts the dog from doing whatever it is, and then you give them something else to do to redirect to it. I use hand targeting. That's what I usually use. That's what I use there. So if uh, all attention is rewarding, so if Ozzy is getting in the trash or dig, eating some poop or doing something we don't like, and I say, yes, and I say, uh, Ozzy, don't do that. I'm giving attention and making him more likely to do that to get attention. This is probably the most common mistake people make with their dogs is they give attention to correct or disagree, thinking that's gonna uh, mitigate the behavior, but it actually causes the dog to be more inclined to offer that behavior again because it gets your attention. And so uh, to counter that, I always go over, uh, well, for the positive interrupter, the positive interrupter is a great way because when we make the interesting sound, the dog looks at us, then we say touch, they run over and touch their nose to our hand, we give mark and reward, then we either put the trash can away, move the shoe away, take them out for some uh, a tree, uh, a walk, give them a bully stick, a collagen stick, a lick mat, do some training, uh, whatever, move, whatever it is. So we're gonna change the scenario so he can't go back and do that. So try to start incorporating that and if he doesn't respond well to the kiss, you can load that as well. <laughs> Treat, but he's, Obviously the kiss works pretty good for him. Um, all right, so we also went over uh, what I like to call celebrating. Celebrating is essentially rewarding the dog when it does the things that you want. Um, and, uh, if, and if you wanna go inside, I don't, uh, you, uh, Chris, you can stay or go, totally fine. Um, uh, and so, um, all right, so celebrating is rewarding the dog when it voluntarily offers you the behavior that you want. And you can stay as well, I'm not chasing you away. <laughs> um, so again, all attention is rewarding and validating. So if the dog gets in the trash, I'm more likely to get in the trash to get your attention. Barking, jumping up, or whatever. There's a million things that dogs do that we accidentally train them to do. So celebrating is just waiting for the dog to voluntarily do the action and you marking and rewarding when they do it on their own without any influence from you. Um, just like little kids, the more that you reward a kid for sharing or saying please or thank you, the more they're likely to offer that behavior again in the future. So uh, to help, because uh, we often forget to do this, is I like to say celebrate. So if uh, Ozzy were to come over to me and I wasn't paying attention, my partner could say celebrate and I just turn over and say yes and pet him. I don't even know what it is. Remember, you only have two seconds after a dog does something to make that connection. So if he sits and somebody sees him sit, that's one second. Then they say celebrate, that's second number two. They say celebrate to me, I go, what am I celebrating? I have blown the opportunity. So once somebody, yes. So if he walks by you, just say yes and pet him. If he sits down, yes and pet him, lays down. Eye contact, go in the dog bed, drinking water, pooping, anything that you want him to do, stretching that he does on his own, mark and reward. And if your partner forgets that, you say celebrate to them, they just say yes and immediately pet him, they don't even know what it is. Um, the flip side of that is uh, what I call teaching dogs manners through the concept of the do-over. So if Ozzy comes up and he's nudging you with his nose or he's pawing at you or barking for attention, he's kind of saying, hey, give me your attention. And is it wrong to pet a dog? Of course not, never. But whatever our dog is doing right before we give them attention, including petting, is what we are specifically rewarding them for. So if he nudges me and I pet him, he's going to nudge me more often to get me to pet him or jump up or bark or any of those things. So if he nudges me, I'm gonna give him the do-over concept. He's saying, hey, pet me. I'm gonna say, would you like to ask for that again? By saying, sit, one time only. And if he sits, then I say yes, and then I pet or reward him. If he doesn't sit, playing hard to get works great for training, uh, it works great for dating, also works great for dog training as well. Stepped on my own mind. So basically, if I say sit and he doesn't sit, I'm just gonna lean back and read the paper. I'm gonna play the guitar. 
I'm going to uh, play with the kids, uh, read an email, yes. Um, do something else. Dogs don't need to be punished to learn. So if he doesn't do what I want, more power to you, but you're not getting my attention. And then if we counter that with celebrating, he's thinking like every time I sit down, they give me attention. Every time I lay down, they give me attention. He'll start coming in front of you and sitting down to prepay for the attention. When he does, you better pet him. Um, after a while, he'll get into doing that, and every time you pet him, it becomes a little micro dog training session. Yes, just like that, without you even thinking about it. That took me no time whatsoever. If you stack that up, if everybody does that in the family 25 times a day, we got 100 practice sessions a day, and that's a pretty low number. Now, um, before I get to what I was going to talk about next, remember the, extra, uh, the story I told you about the uh, kids and getting candy for petting the dog. If you forget how to do that, let me know, but I think that your kids are great, um, but they might benefit from that. It gives them more of a motivation to ask Ozzy to sit or lay down or whatever it is. He help, it helps him practice listening to them. It helps uh, him have, re in general, more respect for them as an authority figure. Uh, it just really is beneficial, and it helps him with his overall training because he's practicing. Training is very much a numbers game. Now, uh, I think uh, from what I observed is that Ozzy actually, his cues are actually the lures and they're not the actual verbal cues quite yet. I think they're kind of maybe 25% verbal, 75% the lure. So what I'd like you guys to do, and this is a great way to drain energy as well, is just pick one of those cues at first. You can do a couple if you want. But I would just say, uh, Ozzy, and I'd hold a treat to his lips, lure him into a sit, and, and or uh, I guess for you guys, you guys do it a little different. You guys just hold your hand up like that and he sits. So make sure you say, sit, yes, treat. Take a couple steps away. Sit, yes, treat. Sit, yes, treat. And do it separately like that. So the lure, as I say sit at the same time, the dog does the action, I say my marker word, then I reach for the treat and pet him or give him a, uh, pet him or give him the reward. Then I would do it like, you know, uh, five or six times in a row. He's kind of doing it very easily. Then I would just either, so if I'm going sit, yes, treat, then I would go, Sit, yes, treat. So I'm doing like five or six in a row using that motion. And then after six or so in a row, I just say the verbal cue without raising my arm. If he, if he doesn't respond to that, the next time I might say sit instead of raising my arm all the way here, I might raise it only this far. So you're going to gradually, we call this fading the lure. We're going to do less and less of the lure and more of the auditory cue so that we can say sit and he does it. So otherwise, if I'm holding a bunch of stuff, I can't say sit and without dropping stuff. So this is a great way for him to, uh, to you guys, to drain a little Aussie energy. Also a great way for Aussie to develop more of a, a profound, uh, you know, uh, response to your cues by doing it with the auditory response. Um, and that's something that you could do with sits, downs, um, going to your dog bed, what, uh, you know, whatever they are. Um, the idea is we're going to lure the dog first until it's easy to lure them. Then we try to use a, a motion which is kind of a lure, but luring, we would maybe have a treat. I'm luring the dog. Then I would get lure with just the motion with the treat in the other hand, and eventually just the cue. And uh, training is, remember, not a linear process, so you're going to have ups and, ups and downs. Just make sure you practice this in a lot of different areas. Like I mentioned, it's important for dogs to have a lot of variety uh, when you're practicing so they can do it. They know that it works in the backyard, the living room, the dining room, and so on. Um, all right, so I would do that with, uh, I would identify all, what all the cues are. Now, the family here, I think, is pretty good about it. A lot of people don't realize that they come up with several versions of a verbal cue for a dog. Come, here, come here, come here, over here, here, boy, dog's name, dog's name, name whistle, tap my thigh. That's 10 different ways of calling a dog, but that makes it 10 times as hard for him. So what I would do is uh, have you guys sit down and make a list of all the official cues that he has, and then ask, is it, what do we say for come? Are we both saying come? I've had a lot of families where one person says come, somebody says here, somebody else says come here. Now he has to listen for three different words. That makes it a little bit slower for him and harder for him. So let's just make it easier. Yes! And that's a good celebrate right there. I didn't ask him, but he ran over and he got a reward for coming over. A lot of times dogs don't respond to come because it represents in a fun. I'm in the backyard yelling at the squirrel, you asked me to come and then I can't yell at the squirrel anymore because you closed the door. So, um, all right, so uh, let me see. We went over fetch. So he likes you to pull the ball, you've been pulling the ball out of his, out of his hand, out of his mouth. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna, I just have treats here, Ozzy. So he comes over, yes. So I just hold the treat to his lips wait for him to drop. When he drops it, I say yes, then put the tree in his mouth. Now I'm going to build in some impulse control. Sit. Yes. Fetch. So now he gets to run and get the ball. 
I'm pulling out a treat. We'll see if we can get him to drop it on his own. Yes. Now the ball's over there. You gotta go get the ball. Um, you can kind of hold the treat and have him drop it in your hand if you want. Um, but the idea is you're gonna condition him to get the ball right there over there. Yeah, I know it's, it's green on green grass. That's hard for you to see, you're colorblind. There we go. There you go, Ozzy. Um, and then he starts bringing the ball back to you. Um, and again, I think for him, fetch is gonna be really profound. I think that he needs to go fetching like three to five times a day, maybe five minutes of fetch each time every two hours. And then, if, and then we also talked about other things that we can do, uh, like feeding him out of a snuffle mat. Uh, snuffle mat is like two, sh uh, is like a short walk. If we feed him out of snuffle mat twice a day, that's two short walks. If we come out maybe in the morning before the kids go to school, we play five minutes of fetch. In the morning, I try to do a little bit longer if I can because that's setting off your day. So maybe in the morning we pace eight minutes of fetch. And again, we're, break we're incorporating some, uh, some impulse control. So he brings you the ball, you hold the treat out, he drops it, you say yes, put it in there. After a while, when he brings the ball and you can anticipate he's gonna drop it, he comes over to you, say drop, he drops it, yes, give him the treat. Eventually, just come over and drop the ball, but now you're also building in a drop cue. So you say drop, means if I drop something, I'm gonna get something better than what I have. That's a really important thing to have. That's a pretty big stick. Um, he has a big log he's chewing on. Um, okay, so then there's also uh, training is a great way to drain energy. Um, playing tug of war is great for him because as soon as his energy level gets to level five, or if he touches it with his, with his teeth, we just drop it and the game is over. So after a while, he learns to stay under, four point, uh, under five level five energy or 50% of his energy range. Um, we also went over cookie in the corner. That's the one where we said fetch and uh, find it and throw a treat. When he licks up the treat, we say yes. Then we say come, he comes back to us. We say yes and give him a second treat. Then we throw two treats and as we find it as we throw them. Yes, yes, as he licks them up and then come, he comes back to us. Yes, give him a treat. And we work our way up to throwing about seven. Now only do this in areas that it's okay for him to look. Don't do it near the kid's toys or whatever. We don't want to confuse him into chewing the wrong thing. Now if I'm throwing treats, it looks like this. If I'm pointing, it looks like this. It looks pretty similar. So after a while, what you do when you're playing the same area, you can just go place the treats against the baseboard or against the leg of the chair and then bring them over and say, Ozzy, find it. And he goes over and starts sniffing the ground. Sniffing burns a tremendous amount of energy for dogs. It's also stimulating. It's, uh, uh, it builds their confidence if done in certain ways. And so this is a great way for him to release some of that pent up en uh, energy that he has. Um, and so, because uh, he's using his nose. This is a great, these are great activities to do in the house because it doesn't require the humans to do much work. Now, I'd like you to Google scent games, S-C-E-N-T. Find three or four scent games that you can practice in the house. Maybe the kids play hide and seek. Maybe put a treat under a solo cup and kind of do the shell game, uh, whatever it is. But if you do a couple of those things, and maybe that's uh, we do a scent game once or twice a day for two, four minutes in the house. And then maybe we uh, also, uh, you know, we're teaching him to go to his dog bed or the exercises I showed you in the video above, helping him practice moving away from the door. Maybe do that twice a day. So we have twice a day with the no uh, jumping at the door and going to your dog bed, twice a day for the scent games. Uh, we're doing walk around the house, teaching him his, his sit, uh, sit cues or whatever they are that twice a day. Um, we're feeding him out of a snuffle mat twice a day and we're playing fetch three times a day. That's 11 things that, that are pretty easy for you to do two to five minutes multiple times throughout the day. I guarantee it's gonna have a very profound impact on him because he's a lab, he's full of energy. And all his energy is gonna kind of cascade across everything you do. Getting into a habit that works for you guys that releases that pent up energy is gonna be, like I said, really profound. It's gonna really help. Um, let me see, we also went over, uh, I guess I was talking about celebrating. Celebrating is when we reward Ozzy, when Ozzy chooses to do things on his own. But the flip side of that is what I call the do-over concept. So if Ozzy comes up and he's nudging you, instead of petting him, we're gonna tell him to sit. If he sits, we say a mark, I think I went over this. I'm um, sorry, <laughs> it's Saturday, I'm a little punchy. But basically, uh, we're gonna use the, uh, the word of manners for that one. So if somebody comes in and we see that Ozzy's jumped up on me and I'm petting him, they say manners, I stop petting him, tell him to sit. If he sits, I say yes and pet him. If he doesn't sit, I just go back to what, doing what I was doing. And after a while, like I said earlier, he will come and start sitting to prepay for that attention. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, there's also um, uh, Kongs, which I'm sure you guys have used, but you can fill the Kong up with peanut butter or cream cheese and you can start, yes, putting those in the freezer. That makes it last longer. Carrots are also a great uh, thing to give to him to chew. I would get a big carrot, big, big, big old cat of carrots, give him one of those every other day. 
Um, and so those are, it has a nice cancer fighting property, same thing with bro broccoli florets, but I would just probably do that maybe once a month, just demolish one on top of his food. Uh, but again, getting that snuffle mat will help him work for his food. And then you can put his wet food in the bowl afterwards um, as kind of a dessert for eating it, your food. But you only get the wet food if you eat the dry food. Otherwise, he'll just hold off on, won't eat the dry food to wait for the wet food. Well, the wet food only comes after you eat your dry food. Um, let me see. Uh, if you have problems with that stuff, let me know. Uh, we also went over the importance of uh, self-restraint. Um, we talked about doing that with a little bit of the fetch, but asking uh, the pre-mac principle, less desirable behavior earns you a more desirable behavior. So when I go to the door, I'm going to tell him to sit. When he sits, then I open the door and let him out. If I say sit and he doesn't open the door, or he doesn't sit, I go sit down, I wait one minute. Then I go back to the door, I tell him to sit again. If he doesn't sit in two seconds, and I'm only asking one time, if he doesn't say it, the more you say it, the less you mean it. If he doesn't sit this time within two seconds, I walk away for two minutes. Next time I come back, I say sit. If he doesn't sit, I walk away for four minutes, then for eight minutes. You should only do this if the dog knows how to do the cue, which we're no, we know he does. Um, but we double the length of time each time until eventually when I say sit, he sits and then the door opens. So if I want the door to open, I better go sit at the door. Uh, when you're on walks, um, ask him to sit before you uh, cross each block um, or cross in the street. I know you don't walk him a ton right now, but uh, hopefully the, if, I have, if I haven't linked above uh, the video to the loose leash walking, please add that in there. Uh, please message me and I'll add it in there for you. But if you're doing uh, like the stutter technique out on a walk, maybe you're out on a walk and you're waiting for uh, you can't find a dog. We can do practice a little stutter technique or one, one step and give him a treat. Um, but there's nothing wrong with doing those sort of things when you're on a walk or find it on a walk so that he gets used to doing these other things on a walk as opposed to pulling to get to wherever it was. Now, uh, for the loose leash walking, the first exercise I teach is silky leash. And that's where we have him stationary and we're stationary and he's standing. And if he's moving, walk around and make sure you take the tension off the leash. As soon as he's stationary, there's tension on the leash, relax the leash, and then add a light amount of pressure. It doesn't have to be a lot, just a very light pressure. And we just wait until he gives into the pressure. Now, if I'm pulling the leash this way, I usually like to keep the leash shorter than my arm length, so it's easier for me to get full, uh, full pressure. And I have the clicker in my, the end of my, uh, my hand that's holding the leash. So that way, when I click, he's actually going towards the clicker which kind of helps with the outside stuff that we're working on, the, uh, that we went out um, teaching him not to be reactive to other dogs. So uh, the idea is uh, uh, we're teaching him just when you feel pressure on the leash to give into that pressure. So when you're doing all these exercises, I proof with what I call the five for five method. So if you are doing that five times in a row, if he does it only two correct times out of five times, that means you need to back up to an easier level. If he does it three out of five times, I'm gonna stick and keep on practicing the level we're at. If he does it four out of five times in a row, then that means I can move to the next level. But like we talked about inside, when kids learn a new skill, we don't stop teaching that lesson, and we do that for dogs. Once we teach him to sit, we stop practicing the sit. Same thing with loose leash walking. So once he gives in right away, Move to a different room, do it again four out of five times. I like to have maybe two or three practice sessions where he's doing it properly before I level up. Leveling up for you guys would be practicing on the driveway right outside your back door. You're practicing the leash, uh, the silky leash train until four out of five times he does it there, practice a little bit more after that. Then we're gonna practice it here in the backyard without the other dog barking, without the coyote jumping the fence. Before I forget, um, coyotes don't actually jump the fence, they climb the fence. So if you get a PVC pipe, it's 10 feet long, cut along one axis so it's kind of like a Pac-Man, and then put it on the top of the fence right here so that it's, the PVC is going a cascade, uh, capping the top. Coyotes don't so much uh, climb uh, the fence or jump the fence as they do climb it. They run up and they get a paw over it and they pull over. That round PVC will not allow them to get a grip. It'll keep the coyotes out of your yard. Um, and I would continue to let him out just, uh, just for the off chase so they can find a, a place where they can do it. But that PVC pipe is pretty cheap. It's just finding somebody who can cut it for you. Um, okay, so for the loose leash walking, uh, the silky leash training is the first one. That's pulling, putting the pressure, pressure on leash. The second is the leash pressure bowl game, where we're putting bowls on opposite sides of a long thoroughfare where we can walk back and forth. Now remember when you're doing this, hold, give him however much leash you're going to give him, usually about three or four feet. 
Hold it in your hand and push it against your sternum of your chest and push this direction. When he's pulling, the further away from your, your body you go, he gets, the, or the, the end of the leash is, the weaker you are. The st closer your body, the more control you're going to have. So if you're pushing here, he's gonna have, you're going to have more control for him. Um, and if it moves a little bit each time he does it, he gets what I call the illusion of progress. So if you're holding it here and he pulls because he's so strong and he pulls your arm out here, he thinks he the pulling just was rewarded with an extra foot. If you're here, it's going to be hard for him to pull it off and you're consistent and consistency is the name of the game when it comes to dog training. So then we're going to walk towards the bowl. If I anticipate he's going to start pulling, I stop and I anchor my feet, might pull back, uh, lean back a little bit, or as soon as he pulls, I stop. Also, the last foot, hey buddy, uh, that you get right up next to the bowl is usually when the dogs, uh, yep, <laughs> uh, is usually when they're going to pull again. So those are the times I anticipate. And what we saw in the house is pretty normal. You'll see him the first couple times he's going to pull like crazy. Then he's going to start kind of checking and watching your pace. So as soon as he stops or as soon as he releases that pressure, pressure you say yes and then you start walking forward. Usually after you say yes, you want to give them a reinforcement, a pet or a treat. In this case, he wants to get to the treat at the end of the, at, at the, end of the line. So by saying yes and then continuing the walk, that becomes the reward. So um, practice that one again, four out of five times in the house and practice a little bit beyond that. And don't just practice the direction that we did from the back front door to the back door. Also practice from uh, the kitchen to the kids room, you know, wherever you have a straight line uh, that we can get several steps. Once you do a four out of five times consistently, then I would practice right outside your back door, four out of five times consistently, practice a little bit more after that. <laughs> there he goes. Uh, then practice in your backyard, then in your front yard with nobody there. And eventually your front yard when maybe there's uh, a dog walking across the street or a kid walking across the street or whatever it is. Um, now remember, when he has dogs around, he goes into a hysterical state of mind. So he's not going to be, it, he's going to lose his loose leash walking skills if they get too close. Now for practicing, the, uh, the uh, engage disengage game is what it's officially called or what I like to call click for looks, which I should have linked up here, um, he's going to get less and less aroused by other dogs. What we're looking for is a neutral or a positive response. For him, neutral would be fine. Neutral means I'm indifferent to it. Positive as I want to play with it. Um, I don't know if he's allowed to chew this ginormous uh, log. Okay, um, and so for this, water buffalo horn. Remember, uh, get a water buffalo horn. If you get one at a store, make sure it's thick. Don't get one with a thin wall because he will splinter that. But a water buffalo horn will smell funky for a couple of weeks, but after that, it'll just be great chewing for him because it's organic and he'll, uh, it'll probably outlast Ozzy. Um, okay, let me see what else. Um, uh, for the, the next uh, techniques for uh, the loose leash walking, one of them is we have people uh, luring the dog into a heel position. The video should explain that pretty easily. Um, and then we do, uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, treats and we take one step in the house. Yes, and deliver the treat. Make sure you deliver the treat behind the seam of your pants. And sometimes well, people just hold the treats here. I just worry about him just kind of nudging your hand and trying to bite your hand to get it out. But if he's not, you can hold it here. You take one step, yes, release treat. One step, yes, release, just one step at a time. And as you saw, I only did a little bit. I did it for like 20 seconds. And then he started walking next to me in that same heel position. Now, we call it the heel position. I don't want him to have to exclusively walk there. On a loose leash walking, we just want him to not pull on the leash. He can go wherever he wants. That's why it's important on walks that you walk him to where he wants to go because otherwise he's gonna to try to pull again there, he's thinking you're gonna leave him out. Now, also have treats in your hand when you're on regular walks. Every time he looks at you, say yes and hold the treat out. You maybe extend an inch or two toward him, don't go towards him. What I'm going to do is when he does a check-in, you're ready for it, you say yes, and I have the treat. I'm not reaching for it. Yes, hold out a treat, he comes back to you, you give him the treat, and then we start walking. After a while, he'll start checking with you more often and he's coming back towards you. That is a foundational element of loose leash walking, is making you more powerful and more important than your environment. And also, every time I check in with you, I am rewarded for doing it. A lot of times, it looks at us, we're like, uh, hey, good boy, and we reach the treat, he's already on the next thing, or deal with the kids or our partner or whatever. So have that treat in your hand, and as soon as you give it to him, pull another one out. That's why I would recommend you get this. This is the mini uh, uh, treat pouch for pet safe. I saw you taking a picture. There's a bigger one that comes in different, uh, different colors. Yes! And, uh, but this one allows you to have the treats with you, your poop bag and everything, and you clip it right on your belt. Sit. Yes. Now there's another game that you can play, um, an orientation game. So when he looks at me, I'll play it right now. Yes. When he looks at me, I'm gonna say yes to mark the eye contact, then I'm waiting for him to look at me, he's looking at my hands. Yes. And I throw the treat away. Yes. 
and he's got to go in the grass to find it. So I can be, I do this a lot of times. I'm on a, a dog that I, like, I have the dog on like a six or eight foot leash and there's another dog nearby. He looks at me and I throw the treat over there. He goes and sniffs to find it. Now this is really more of a distraction exercise. It's not, tr it's not conditioning him that other dogs are good, but sometimes you have a dog that you just don't want to deal with or whatever it is, just getting him to check in and reward, uh, checking in with you on walks is going to be really profoundly helpful. And then playing this game, he doesn't have to come to you. He just looks at you and you throw a treat on either side of him and he's looking for those. Now another thing you can do on walks is uh, exercise him before the walk. Give him 10 minutes to rest. Make sure he doesn't have a uh, full stomach when you're exercising him. Um, and then give him 10 to 15 minutes to rest, then take him for a walk. That often leads to a more productive walk. If he gets very excited for the leash, as soon as he gets excited, put the leash back and sit down. Practicing leashing him up when you're not taking him for a walk is a great way to get that energy level down. It's called desensitization. And a little schmegma on my hand from him. So, uh, so again, every time you pull out the leash, guaranteed we're going for a walk. That's classical conditioning. So now we pull out the leash and as soon as he gets excited, I put the leash back up. When eventually I get, pull the leash out and put it on him and he's not excited and then I let him wear it for five minutes, take it off. So we get him used to having the leash attached without the excitement of going for a walk. And after a while, he's going more, uh, he's more and more relaxed. The energy he has starts in the house before you open the door is the energy he's going to start off the walk with. So if we take the time to help him be calm when the equipment is applied, that's going to have an impact. What we're doing when it comes to dog behavior modification is a whole lot of little things that add up to big things. And it's just really being strategic and smart about how you're incorporating things. Um, so we get him used to being calm on the leash. We have treats with us. So every time he looks at us, we're saying yes. Now, he also loves to sniff the ground. Well, getting some, uh, you, don't, you live in a good neighborhood where you can get away with doing this. Get some shredded Swiss cheese. Go out ahead of the walk. Go to this side of the sidewalk and sprinkle some shredded Swiss cheese into the grass. Not only one clump, kind of, he's got to work for it. And then maybe two or three paces on that side of the sidewalk, we sprinkle a little bit more. And then a couple more paces over there. At first, we're doing every couple of paces. And we're leading him right to those caches of, uh, or caches of, uh, of uh, sh shredded cheese. After a while, he starts looking on the ground for the cheese. Now, he's already looking to sniff, but he's kind of pulling a lot when he's doing it. And if you have those treats and you, uh, the, the little uh, cheese caches, um, and you're leading him to those, and they're happening frequently, he's going to be more aligned to be looking closer to you. And again, checking in with you because you have the really good treats. Um, then the last one, uh, I guess for the loose leash method, there's eight steps that we typically teach, but the most important profound one is the stutter method. And that's the one after I do one step, treat, one step, treat, eventually I can go two steps, treat, two steps, treat, three steps. I work up to about five or six treats and I'm walking around. The last thing that I do uh, for the stutter method, or one of the main things is as soon as, and I just start walking, as soon as he loses interest, walks in front of me, I start walking backwards. He recognizes that he turns, as soon as he comes close to me, then I turn around and start walking forwards again. He does a U-turn, now he's walking, I take one step, yes, and give him that treat. Because we want him, you know, life happens. He's gonna see a butterfly or something he's gonna go check out on this side or that side. But then we wanted to reorientate back towards us. So I'm gonna have a link to a write-up that I did with another client here that has, shows all those tips. But if you have questions about that, let me know. But remember, loose leash walking, big mistake is trying to teach it on an actual walk. So go through the leveling method for all of those exercises in the house, then right outside the back door, then the front backyard, then the front yard with nobody around, front yard with people around or dogs around, and eventually on the actual walk. Um, Trying to think what else. Feed him on a uh, snuffle mat. We talked about that. Um, li oh, uh, licking and chewing. Um, and again, I think I talked about the video above, but a lick mat is a nice thing that you can slather peanut butter on. Uh, so, like if you're trimming his nails or whatever. Um, I've got a video on nail trimming if you want. Uh, let me know about that and I'm happy to share that with you. Um, yes. I'm trying to think, is there anything else we covered today, buddy? We covered a lot and I, it was a lot of talking. So, I want to give your mom and dad as many tips as possible. Sit. Yes. Oh, that's a good, what a good lay down. Um, but yeah, uh, besides that, if you have any other questions, let me know. Now this video, what I usually recommend my clients do is watch this video once a week till when you watch this video, there's nothing new there. If that's the case, and you're still having problems, let me know. And I'm happy to set up a follow-up session. In the meantime, while you're practicing this stuff, if you have something, you reach a plateau or something stops working, let me know call or text me. I don't charge for that. I want you to call me. If I don't hear from you, I assume that means everything's going great. So please let me know if you have any questions or problems. Ozzy, touch. Uh, the touch hand is over here. Sit. I'm not, uh, last little thing. Teaching him to stay. 
When you teach to stay, there's three Ds, duration, distance, and distraction. Most people try to teach all three at once, which is a disaster. I teach distractions first. So stay, yes, stay, yes, and then I believe your word is break. So when I'm doing distractions, usually I would say stay, then I flare my elbow once, then I say my mark word, and then I give them a treat. And those are all four distinct separate events. That's one second. One, so if I say sit, stay, one second, two seconds. Yes, treat. Just make sure afterwards you always release him by throwing a treat to the side. Um, I have a video on stay, but I do distractions until I can do like, looks like I'm break dancing. I do 15 distractions without moving away. Moving away is very difficult for dogs. So get to the point where you can do a whole bunch of distractions. Once you pass five seconds, start breaking eye contact. But teaching him to stay, it is the grandfather of all impulse control exercises. So teaching him to stay causes him to have a target and he knows what to do once he's learned the concept. That will help profoundly in a lot of the other areas that you're going over. Um, trying to think is there anything else we want to cover mr gobble the nose with your nostrils all right well let's get you back over here so we can sign off ozzy come here come here sit this is my buddy ozzy oh the loot uh i guess the hand uh the uh, uh the uh, gentle so i have a treat in my hand i can do it one of three ways i can put it in the palm of my hand like that and fold it over i can feel his teeth That's, those are teeth. Yes. And as soon as he licks, I say yes and I release it. That was a little bit, he was getting me a little bit there. So for the other one I do it is I hold my thumb over it like this. Yes. And as soon as he licks, I say yes and release the treat. When he gets good at this, I know he's going to lick right away. Then I would say gentle. Now he did, he was using his teeth there. Um, this is a hard one to teach later on. The other thing you can also do is put a hot dog bit or something on the, on the tines of a fork, but put it down low so he can't just grab it off right away. He's going to chomp the fork the first couple times, then he, that the metal doesn't agree with him. After a while, he'll start licking. And we can anticipate the lick. Then he would say, gentle, present it. He licks it off with his tongue. And then he gets the, uh, you say, yes, he, uh, well, I guess gentle. He licks it off with his tongue and he gets the reward. You can say, guess, I guess, uh, yes, when he, you see the lick. Um, but after a while, when you're giving him treats, you can say gentle. He at least understands what you mean. But keep in mind, the more excited he is, the more likely he's going to be to be toothy. Touch. Oh, uh, that's one last, last thing. On walks, instead of pulling him on a leash, try to use this. If you, and you, that's why we teach hand targeting is to reposition dogs. So uh, a lot of people actually, uh, actually hold their hand at their side and they're teaching the dog to touch their nose with the hand and that's how they teach loose leash walking. I don't do that myself, but use hand targeting to reposition him if you can as opposed to pulling him with the leash because the more you pull on the leash, the more he's gonna pull. Also, it's gonna cause an intensity, uh, intensify his emotional response. All right, let's sign off, Ozzy. Sit, no, that's not a sit, that's a down. Come here. Sit. This is my buddy Ozzy, and this is Ozzy's Roadmap to Success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.